Hey, welcome all you wiretappers. Good to be back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I've got my good friend, Camillus Robinson, Cam Robinson. Welcome, Cam. Good to see you. Hey. I haven't talked to you for a while. Hey, Gary, I can't tell you how much it means to me to be back and be back in the studio with you. It's such a such a great time, and I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm really excited about today's show. Really good. Yeah, we're going to do Jimmy the Bomb Katura. Is that how you pronounce that, Cam? Katura? Katura, yeah. Katura? Yeah, that's, a, that's, okay. a, that's how I would say, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, 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 you, know, you know how everybody laughs about how I drag out my vowels up here. <laughs> Not as bad, much as they laugh about me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, one guy said, well, that hillbilly twang that guy's got. He said, man, he, he can't be telling me about the mafia. <laughs> I had to get everybody to, to help me out with the Joey, I, uh, Joey Ayupo. Ayupo, yeah, yeah. Ayupo. Yeah, you did do that. And I, and I, I do that I with a little Italian. bit of I've got no, uh, I am Italian. I've got no excuse. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm full of excuse. <laughs> Anyhow, we're going to talk about Jimmy the Bomber Couture, you know, and, and Cam, he came over as a child, I believe, from Sicily. Now, if I'm wrong on that, let me know, guys, but it, it, it looks like he was naturalized after he got here, but probably as a young man or a child, you know, he, he got married, had a couple of kids and 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 we're talking about the the twenties. By nineteen twenty nine, he's he is in his early twenties, I believe. And you know the stock market crashes, and and he's a young guy, got a couple of kids, trying to scuffle out a living. And kind of an interesting note I found on that when the stock market crashed, banks weren't lending out money. And you know what happened when the banks quit lending out money? That's when the loan shark business started. I never put that together before did you cam do you ever think about that you know i i didn't in that in that capacity it's it's interesting how there was such a conglomeration of so many different things that, that went into in that time period like you said the banks collapsed the uh alcohol became illegal all the immigrants started pouring into the country and that that confluence of different things really is is what what blew up what we came to no, is is the mafia? You know, it was all it was just the perfect storm that led yeah. to all these rackets that that blew up. I mean, it really was the time and the place to start an organized crime empire. Really, and and you know, loan shark. And if you think about it, they had all those Sicilian immigrants, and mm -hmm. and the banks were all ran by the English and the Germans, and they're not going to loan anything to new newly arrived immigrant. Plus, the immigrant can't read the their paperwork, and and probably can't speak the language. So you know, the loan sharking business, you know, was going to come up. It was really interesting, and with with bootlegging. Right. And a variety of other things. Of course, there was some narcotics business going on at the time coming out of Cuba, going up through the Midwest and 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 in New York, and that was all by the mafia. So, you know, it was it was a perfect storm for that. You know, he ends up being, you know, they list him in the census census in the 1930 census as a presser in a trailer shop, tailor shop, but pretty a few years later, he's a retail meat market owner and then he's an inmate in the illinois state penitentiary during this time so <laughs> he's a real renaissance man he is a renaissance man he, he's a man for all seasons <laughs> the census did indicate he had completed the fourth grade uh so he wasn't i like most of these guys you know they didn't go if they went to high school that was back then especially hardly anybody went to high school unless you were of a certain class all the working class kids, you went to eighth grade, ninth grade, and then you were on, you were working. Work. So that that's what he did. But he, he was maybe not a, you know, a genius scholar, a road scholar, anything like that. But he learned the streets and he learned it from a guy, which is interesting, a guy named James Bella Castro, who was known as the King of Bombers. So he learned mm -hmm. from the King of Bombers and he will eventually become known as the Jimmy the Bomber Katura. So go figure that, man. That's, <laughs> that's right. And Bel Castro was a big deal. He, there were a couple of guys who, who came after Bel Castro who, who took that name, the Bomber. But, you know, they he had a whole string of bombers that came after Bel Castro. Matter of fact, one of his early arrests was he and a guy named William Palermo were apprehended with a bomb. And that was mm -hmm. in 1933. Even got a little description of it. He had seven sticks of dynamite and uh, they were going to get ready to go to trial. And the defense would contend that the bomb was planted on them by the cops, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works, but I guess, you know, I guess they were, you know, it'd be possible they'd try to shake them down or something. Uh, those same cops 
would testify that he had offered him a thousand dollar bribe while he was at the police station. So he was doing pretty good early thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of damn money in uh, 1933. Jesus, I don't know how I don't know how you could resist that in 1933. Wow. I couldn't I couldn't bribe a cop for a thousand dollars tomorrow. If you <laughs> really, <laughs> they charge him with attempted bribery and, and he ended up getting five to 25 years. I never understood those indeterminate sentences, but I think mm -hmm. it's I think it is to to keep people, keep them better prisoners because they've got a chance of maybe getting out because you have this indeterminate sentence. So, you know, you could be a good prisoner. And then have a chance at, at getting out early because you don't, there's not a locked in time that you have to stay there, wouldn't you say? Would would you hazard that, a guess on that? That makes really good sense. That, that I I hadn't thought about it. I've seen those sentences before, you know, in the reading that you and I do a lot, and it, I I never really got it. I thought you know that was sort of a broad outlining, but it really does make sense, and it is sort of a, a you know a reason that they should an incentive for 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 good behavior. You know, and he was in Chicago. And it seemed like this is the 30s, but Capone had something to do with the dairy business at one time. And this was this bomb was arrest was something to do with a string of bombings in the dairy business. So somebody was trying to line up the dairy business back during the 30s, yeah. I would say. That was Curly. Curly Humphreys had a lot to do with that. They figured if you could if you could line up the milk and, you know, milk was everywhere. You had the it, it just. Just like with everything, you had the, the the milk unions, and they delivered the milk around. Just like with, you know, years later in, in Jersey and places, you have the garbage. But as you could line up the the milk lobbies, that was one of the first unions that they were known for for getting lined up was 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 the uh, the milk haulers, and that actually led to several types of legislation for how clean milk had to be and different things. I mean, it was really revolutionary how Curly viewed the the, the unions and things. Yeah, he was he was a genius. He was smart. He was an organizer. He he knew he didn't need to go around beating people up and robbing stores and, and transporting narcotics or, and That's booze was, was legal by now. But he knew to get into those unions and organize people and extort money from businesses. Oh, yeah. Guy was a guy was a genius, really. He registered for the draft. They, they found out in, in, you know, for World War II, but he never served. A lot of guys did serve in World War II, whether you're in the mob or not, but a lot of people served. It's kind of unusual if you didn't. He was a little bit old, actually, I think, to to be going in. Now, the next time he gets questioned about bombings, it, it's about bombing the homes of some brothers that own a paper company, the Victory Paper Company. I'm not sure what that was all about, but... It's alleged that those that paper company was supplying paper to the policy operators. You know, they had to have paper to write down mm -hmm. the bets. You know, interesting thing when I was looking the researching the bomber, they they described the policy and said the name of policy came from the fact that there were there were these insurance policies that people pay like fifty cents a week on or twenty five mm -hmm. cents a week on, and 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 I they. They still have that. And so it was a little bit like that. You'd go, you'd write down their name and get their 25 cents for the the, the wheel for the lottery. And, and so it looked a little bit like, you know, an insurance policy collector, the guys that went around and collected from all the, you know, 15, 25 cents, 50 cents a week from people to they just want to poor people just want a burial policy. I remember that's that, right. that that's been going on a long time. I think oh, there's yeah. still a certain business of that out there. Oh yeah. So anyhow, just a little aside there about the policy. You know, he was uh, he was arrested and charged with and released, of course, uh, for more bombings in Chicago area. He bombed a gas station uh, trying to organize gas station employees to join a union. So the usual kind of mob activities where you need to to force people to intimidate people to join a union or to go on strike or not go on strike or solve a strike or, you know, whatever you need to be done. Win an, win an election. Win an election. This guy would go around and do a little bombing for him. So he, he had that name righteously, man, Jimmy the Bomber That's Katura. Right. And he had it all along. Matter of fact, he he was questioned about that gas station bombing and, and the Teamsters, I guess, I, I don't quite understand this, what I read, the Teamsters offered a reward for whoever was planting these bombs. I'm not quite, I don't quite understand that, but you never know. You got to look into it a little no. deeper sometimes. If you're trying to cover up who did something, you run yeah. the team. 
monsters. You know, that's yeah, that's. that's uh, we'll we'll talk about it sort of a little sleight of hand the mob pulled later on. But that sounds like the kind of thing where, you know, it, if you are the one that does the bomb and you're the one that puts out the reward, it kind of draws the attention away from you. <laughs> Here's one of his first murders that they really tried to link to him. And it was a guy that worked for him as a part time, as in a collection agency that he had, you know, kind of his loan shark and somebody's loan shark business. And he was like, he was going out doing some collecting for a loan sharker for his own loan shark business. And this guy worked for him. That guy was found strangled to death. And then he's trunk, you know, the old Chicago trunk music. They, right. I think they pioneered that. I don't know. <laughs> so that was, that was one of his first, that he was charged or not charged with, but was questioned. So he was, you know, he did have somebody that came up early that challenged him, and that was Albert Toko. Yes. And, uh, you know, he's, he when, was kind of a South Side guy. And and so do you remember, remember when he was kidnapped? This is like, we're jumping on into the 70s. I, mean, I don't know if there's anything else in between. Yeah, there. when they, oh. so in between, <clears throat> you get, Al Toko started into the stolen car racket in the late 60s. He goes into prison. So they're both South Side guys at this time. And you've got Katuaras, is, he's a he's a pretty heavy hitter. He's been around for a long time. Pilato is, a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Toko is an up and coming guy. He works under Pilato. And he starts this, this racket, Indiana and parts of Illinois, really the Wild West, their, their law regarding switching VIN numbers and, and, and keeping track of those records were so lax and, and security was just non-existent as far as what was required to, to for insurance purposes and different things. I mean, so that he discovered this and the racket really shot through the roof. It became eventually a 30 to $40 million a year racket. But Togo goes into prison, late 60s. At that point, Jimmy Guitar comes and he takes over the racket. I mean, it's it's sort of in his neighborhood. And so he decides he's going to step up and he's going to take over Togo's old racket. And he puts together a crew uh, of guys. He's got a guy, Steve Ostrowski, who owns owns a uh, chop shop. All his guys own chop shops, basically. Richie Ferraro and Joseph Theo, Earl Abercrombie. And uh, his main muscle would be Sam Anarino and obviously Billy Dauber. And uh, Billy Dauber is a, a psychopathic murderer, and it's always good to have one of those guys if you if you are a, a mob heavy hitter. So he puts together this bang of go- this band of guys, and uh, Toko eventually gets out of prison. And this was around this time before Toko really Katara was at, at loggerheads with Pilato. Toko thought that I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Katara. There's so many vowels, and you know <laughs> I have a problem with my vowels. So Katara was at loggerheads with Pilato. He thought he was going to take over the Southside crew when Frank Laporte died. There was a meeting at the back of the funeral home when Laporte passed, and you've got you've got Paul the waiter, and you've got you've got Tony Cardo, and they come to the conclusion that after Frank Laporte, it is not going to be Jimmy Katara who takes over the the South Suburban crew, the Southside crew. It's going to be it's going to be Pilato who becomes there, the, the capo down there. And that really, really pushed, uh, that was a, a really bothersome thing for Qatar, who was an old guy, an old school guy, and thought that he really deserved it. And that was about the time that he started taking over Toko's rackets, because Toko was Pilato's guy. And he steps into these, he builds up this crew of heavy hitters that we mentioned. Toko comes out of prison, and Pilato is still having problems with, with this Katara. And so... There was so much money in these chop shops, and all these guys owned their own their own junkyards. And Katara's guys around 1976, the dam broke. Pilato and Toko decide they've had enough, and Katara's got to go. But they can't just take him out because he's got a lot of standing. And believe it or not, there is a lot of respect in that world for the old Sicilian guys. You can't even you know. And I know that we don't always understand the dynamics of of what they consider respect i mean you know gary it's 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 weird uh but his guys don't hold the same so they start taking them out one at a time you know and almost you get you get in october this ostrowski who was like his right hand man and then in in almost two a month in 1977 two in june two in july and then in august and and this is where you really see the wild bunch this is they were the real heavy hitters in taking these guys 
leaked out until you get to San Marino. That was a real public murder. And the Calabrese crew and the Wild Bunch teaming up. And Katara's watching all his guys die. But they can't kill Katara. So they kidnap him. And they sort of warn him. Say, you need to know you're done. You're on the shelf. Interesting. So That was uh, when they tried to shelf him. Let us make sure that everybody understands. Now, this is all, geographically, this is all in the southwest part of Chicago. And this is Chicago. Yeah, southwest this is going to be the southeast, Chicago yeah. Heights crew, right? Correct. The Chicago Heights crew. The Southside crew, Chicago Heights crew. Yeah, correct. I should have called it the Chicago Heights crew. Too, which was ran by Frank Laporte. Goes all the correct. way back to Capone days. Correct. And this, this borders on to Indiana. And so then you've got these different guys out there that have junkyards and of course uh, chop shops you know body shops and they're stealing cars i knew a guy here in kansas city he'd steal cars he'd take them out to a farm and he'd cut them up and then he had a series of body shops that he was connected to and they'd actually call him and they'd say hey i need a you know i need a front clip for a blue cadillac now this guy would go out and find a blue 72 cadillac or 82 cadillac steal that car and and say you'd have part of the parts sold many times and so then he, they'd do runs mm -hmm. clear up through the mid all around the midwest to take mm -hmm. and so that's what these guys were doing yeah. i have to assume was cutting them up yeah. and then selling them to other body shops anywhere else in the country was really strict on where did these parts come from yeah you know where did you get that front clip where did you get that tie rod where did you get these different that 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 right front that door that that where did you get these parts and Indiana and Illinois, they were so lax on their record keeping okay. and their requirements that it was it was literally the Wild West, this specific geographic area, okay. their record keeping methods, it, it really created the perfect storm. That was kind of what what set the stage for this kind of job shop activity. So when Blank Report dies, it's the the hierarchy, Paul Waiter and Tony Accardo. Joe Batters, they meet and, you know, they appoint the next boss of the Chicago Heights crew. And that ends up Correct. being Al Pilato, who, so Jimmy Couture was this old time guy. Now he was, he was, I don't think he was from down there because uh, he got killed way up in the past. Right, really. right. But, yeah. but he, he had been working down there. Mm -hmm. And now he's out in a way. So, <laughs> and Al Toko is in and out of jail, who are going to be more important later on in, in the outfit. But so, I, okay, now I understand. I never understood this chop shop wars because it was yes. geographically so far away from the patch, from, you know, the, the guys downtown from Joy Lombardo and, you know, Cicero and all that, that I, now I finally got my, my mind around that. I, I appreciate right. that's one reason I wanted to do this show to help me get my mind around this chop shop wars. Cause it was so huge. God, they killed so many guys. So I'm sorry. Ken, yeah. You were at the point that they've kidnapped Jimmy Katura, held him yes. in a trunk. I think more than a day or two, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. Like, and that was, that was to let him know. I mean, when we say you're shelved, you're shelved. We're not going to give you another warning. We're not going to, this is it. This is it. You know, and so, because otherwise they would have just killed him. But as, as you know, we mentioned earlier, there is a strange sort of respect for, that, that it has to, it had to exist in that mob world where they didn't just kill every guy that made him mad. I mean, there were rules. They yeah. were obviously broken at times, but there were rules that protected guys is you know in in their own way i mean there was a hierarchy and and they didn't just kill qatar he was an old well-respected sicilian guy and there was a lot of respect for the sicilians in chicago i mean if you look at what happened after Ricardo, basically all the leadership going forward was always Sicilian. so they they didn't just kill him they kidnapped him they you know gave him his walking papers and that, that was that for a while now while this is all transpiring Illinois decides they need to crack down on a lot of this chop shop activity. The, the Illinois State Police forms a special task force led by a lieutenant, Vladimir Ivkovich. And Ivkovich has his old guys, and they really start going after this chop shop activity in Illinois. I mean, statewide, it's it's big. And Ivkovich, one day in, I believe it's 78, he finds a bomb outside of his home. Police, and this is a state police lieutenant. The bomb 
is right next to the gas, you know, the gas hookups for his home. Yeah. I mean, you, you as, a, as, as an officer, that's, that's not <laughs> that's done. That is that not is done. Not that done. Is never done. <laughs> so, but what they, and I think that there were some problems. The bomb wasn't such, they said if it had gone off, but it was just sort of sitting there. And I think it wasn't yeah. active or whatever. It was just sort of sitting there. A bomb happened to be sitting at the, at the, at the home of the police, the state police lieutenant in charge of the chop shops. Yeah. Very shortly thereafter, Jimmy the bomber Katara is executed walking through Chicago. And then it's not, you know, it was never known who planted the bomb or anything like that. But my theory has always been that Katara wouldn't lay down, wouldn't remain shelved, he wouldn't do what he was told. And so this was used as sort of a justification. There was only one guy in Chicago named the bomber at that time. Yeah. So they leave a bomb. A relatively inert bomb, dangerous but relatively inert. They leave it at, at the head guy's place. This guy who would really be going after Toko's guys at the time, because Toko had had basically won the chop shop wars and was starting in with Lombardo. But that's another story. So that justified the execution of Jimmy the bomber Katara, because well, look, guys, he's clearly out of control going after state, state police. So we had to take him out, and then they don't have to worry about. It. They found they found a reason to kill him, to where they didn't have to worry about the Sicilian respect and all that jazz. And that's what I've always seen. That was always my guess. Obviously, it's not written down. Nobody's talked about it. But I always thought that was a false front that they used to justify killing Qatar. Yeah, heck, Katoko, You know, rather than keep dealing with him, mm -hmm. he might have just. Put that bomb up there by the, yes. he knew whoever put that bomb there, they didn't intend on it going off. They didn't Correct. want too much heat brought down on them, but they knew the, the heat was going to come down from that bomb. And, and who's it going to come down on? It's going to come down mm -hmm. on Jimmy the bomber. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a really good uh, uh, theory. I would say, I, I just can't imagine that he would do that. I mean, when you're in that position, you don't really care that much about the police, state police and local police. You kind of worry about the FBI. But by the time you know they're there, it's too late. Anyhow, they're, they're just serving search warrants and getting your records. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was so, an old man at this time. I mean, yeah. you, no, you've seen so. Yeah, I, I would say unless he was a senile old man that uh, thought, <laughs> right. well, this is, you know, like he went back to the old days. He thought he was still working for Al Capone or something. I right, right. <laughs> the pineapple primary, you know. <laughs> really? Well, that's a type of story. You know, it's kind of interesting that they would they would import guys from the, another crew like the Wild Bunch and, and Jerry Scalise and, and Harry Aleman and some of those guys was it Nicoletti? Some of them would bring them down from the Taylor. Was it the Taylor Street crew, or was that the? Yeah, they they were they were a Cicero and then Cicero there was crew. The, the the Cal. Yeah, there were two 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 murderous crews out there. It was the Calabrese crew yeah. and oh, the, yeah. the Wild Bunch. They were the two crews. But still, the the Southwest is so geographically isolated from, well, and it ran all the way to Gary, Indiana. I mean, they yeah. really covered a huge area. So they probably had, uh, they probably had a lot of body shops yeah. down in Gary, Indiana, more than oh, likely. Yeah. It was, it was, that was, you, you, the Chicago Heights crew covered the largest geographic area with the exception of, I mean, of course you can say that, that, you know, Grand Avenue went all the way out to Vegas, but the largest <laughs> geographic area yeah. <laughs> was definitely the Chicago Heights crew. <laughs> Or you could say some of them went down to Des Moines. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's they had exactly Louis Fratto right. down there in Des Moines. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Terry knows Joey. I don't know who they were actually. It's I, I think they were like kind of their own capo of of Des Moines, if you will. <laughs> it was so different back then, you know, compared yeah. to what it what eventually evolved to and how how things were changed. So yeah, they were kind of independent operators. But yeah, yeah once it became more structured. Yeah, this was just geographically, it was just a massive area. Yeah. God, the, the outfit. It's, I can't <laughs> believe there hasn't been more, some kind of movies, decent movies about the outfit. There's so many stories, so many great stories. I keep hearing, and you know, Bulldog Grumman told me that he had been consulted and, and there were people working on at one time a movie on a cardo but it, you know how movies are you hear about one yes. and, then you, and then you just never hear about it again i know two or three like that people you find out you know they've they've even like got people 
saying so and so's playing this part, so and so's playing this part. This director's on board and all that, and then you just never hear from it. Then it again. falls through. Exactly. You just you just never know how that's going to happen. Well, anyhow, I really appreciate you helping me with this story. It's just one of those little stories that I've always been confused about, and I, and I figure if I'm confused, there's a lot of mob fans and and mob scholars that you know are are kind of I say I call, I call ourselves scholars a lot of mob <laughs> interested people the outfit interested people have heard about all this the chop shop wars and jimmy the bomber but i never really understood because like i said yeah. I'm just so geographically disassociated from the rest of the outfit to me that I, I couldn't quite get get it together how that fit how that worked together and I have to assume that whatever they made out there, the Al Palato, then he was kicking back up to a oh, yeah, I'm and sure, yeah. Ayupa later and, on. You know, $30, $40 million a year racket in yeah. total. Of course, the mob wants to not lock down as much of that as possible. And so in addition to what was going on between Katara and Toko, you, they were killing in individual guys, just like when they were trying to to lock down the, the, the street tax. They yeah. were doing basic the the uh, the car theft tax also it was all part of the same citywide scheme that they were doing and so it's it's not always clear who was killed as part of an actual the war and who was killed to get them in line you know it was a really messy time that was going on and and you've seen the list i mean they were dropping bodies left and they right were. guys i'll put in the show notes i'll i'll put a copy of that list so go to the show notes and you can see all the people a little bit about how they died it's kind of interesting it's kind of frightening in a way that they were killing yeah. that many people man and billy dauber of course he was katura's ace number one guy from what i heard you say i didn't really quite realize where he fit in and that was one yeah. of the more more famous mob murders really if you will because again bulldog drummond john drummond almost got to witness that they were watching they had a news crew that were filming billy dahmer coming out of the courthouse it was one of the other northern county courthouses. will county yeah will county and he was coming out and the drummond wanted to follow him and he didn't because they had something else downtown they their producer told him get on back down to the loop and do something film something and dauber and his wife drive away and and who who was in that hit crew was jerry scalise well, yeah, it, it came you out had, uh, uh, the calabrese brothers and and i think you had shelly and i mean you had you had everybody it was a whole crew out there that followed them as they went out and they lived in a rural area and, and killed billy dauber he must have been and charlotte and his wife, too. They must have really been scared of that Billy Dobber to, to go that far to get oh, him. Yeah. Of course, and he I was... think they've said that. I, I think Frank uh, Calabrese Jr. remembers his father talking. And he said, oh, he was very dangerous. It was all of yeah. us. Huh, interesting. All right, Cam, you got anything else we need to say about this? I, I, I you know, the Chop Shop Wars, it was one of the, I, I don't know if you remember this, Gary, but you you did a show about Harry Aleman and I got into the Wild Bunch and that was yeah. one of the, we, us, us doing Butch Petrocelli, but that really led me down the, led me down the Primrose path into the Chop Shop Wars and, and that was really, really what got me started us working together. And and so this is, it's sort of coming back full circle. I mean, oh, this really? is one of the first deep dives that I did for you. And I, I really, I have so much fun coming on here. I really appreciate it. It's been, you know, and I've, I've had a, had a year and I, I really, I really love coming on. I'm going to have to start coming back. All right. We'll, been, we'll uh, get you back more regular and do a few more Chicago stories. I've kind of get yeah, caught up. Absolutely, brother. I tried to do, I, I do a couple, did a couple of Kansas city things. I just put one up about the river key war and then putting oh, one man. up about the war between the Savellas and the Sparrows. I, I did these a long time ago. I thought, well, I just, I'm a, I'm a redo them and, and put them back up again. So I just did them and kind of, I saw I, the one you did about Johnny Green recently. Johnny Green. Yeah. I, I just, he was killed with two guys. I tell you why these two guys, they did, they wanted to take out Johnny Green. He lived about a block from Nick Savella, the boss, and, and they wait for him to come home at light. He had a joint and he comes in late at night and he has a garage door opener. And he opens the garage door and they're standing right around the sides of the garage where you can't see them. To this day, when I pull in my garage, I go ahead and shut the garage door as soon as I can get clear inside because they just step inside and blast him with the shotgun. I mean, you got him trapped right there inside of his car. He can't do anything. That's, that's a scary thing. <laughs> so, yeah, and I don't know. I, I just did a couple. I've got two I just put up about Springfield, Massachusetts. There's a guy named Nick Parisi that wrote a book. 
And then there was a lady, Pasqualina, uh, about Pasqualina uh, Albano, who was married to the guy who has a different name, the king of the bootleggers at one time. And mm -hmm. he got killed by, by this Nick Parisi, who wrote a, his own book. He got killed by Parisi's ancestor, Joseph, I think, Joseph Parisi. So I'm doing the spring, the old days of the Springfield mob here in the next couple of weeks. So Springfield's <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And you know, I found out how come it's still kind of in, influenced by the Genovese family is because of this Pasquale, Pasquale, pa, Pasqualina married a guy from the Genovese family, but he was a weak sister. But he brought some of his relatives out, and he died, actually, of natural causes, I think. But the, the Genovese influence never left Springfield, there's, Massachusetts. There's a gal on the mob beat, a reporter. I'll talk to you offline. But we, yeah, we, it's, oh, you, she does yeah, a great job. talked about her. Yeah, does a great job on the mob beat up there. I've recommended everybody. I, I'll have to dig her name up. But, that you know, there's some great mob mob journalists that are still around. Yeah. And if y'all if y'all dig a little bit, you can find them. There's some there's some good mob writing still, and and it's been going on for a while. So. Yeah, really. Yeah. So, I, I tell you, the guy that I'm always impressed by, and he only does New York stuff. A guy he writes under Ed Scarpo. Yes, he is really really good and really detailed. He knows a lot of people. He's the one that really hooked me up with Michael D. Leonardo out of the Gambino family when I got the chance to interview him. But this guy's got sources like you can't believe. I'm, always impressed with him yeah all right cam all right brother i really appreciate you finish this off guys you know that i like to ride motorcycles so be sure and look out for motorcycles when you're out there and if you have a problem with ptsd and you've been in the service get on the va and get that hotline number and hand in hand with ptsd comes problems with drugs and alcohol well we've got anthony ruggiano former gambino soldier that is has a drug and alcohol well he actually works in a drug and alcohol place down in florida and he's got a hotline on his facebook or his website so be sure and like and subscribe and uh, give me a review and do all that kind of stuff tell your friends about the podcast and you can't check out the gangland wire podcast group anymore so find me on Facebook, if you're interested, and I'll invite you to join. We had to go private. We got too many, had too many, uh, too much stuff going on. <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. It's, it's a big podcast group. It's got a lot of really interesting discussions from people who are, you know, grew up in the neighborhoods or had relatives that were involved in different families, whether it's Chicago or or New York or Kansas City or or whatever. I even had a Kansas City mob guy on there who ran another Kansas City guy that's kind of a periphery guy off because he posted up some pictures. So <laughs> he scared him. <laughs> so I got a Kansas City mob guy on it too. <laughs> Anyhow. All right, uh, Cam. Thank you. I've got, let me do a quick plug. I've got my book, Swan Song, with uh, Frank Calabrese Jr.'s wife. Swan Song, sort of a real Chicago mob wife. It's a it's a great, great, great story of a, a different take on a story for a mob wives telling how a, a strong woman dealt with a a, a hitman as her father in law. And I really, I really think everybody should check it out. It's a, it's a good look inside a mob family from from a view that you don't see very often. So. Yeah. It's a great book, folks. I've read it. We, we've got it. If you look up, I've got an old interview somewhere in the last year, year two years. I don't know. It's, you can find it on the, you know, just search for Lisa Swan, uh, Camillus Robinson, Gangland Wire. You'll find that interview too. But yeah, it, it's a really good book. I hear she might go out and do a show in Las Vegas with Frank That's, Calabrese. Her husband, her know, ex-husband is out there or he's pushing for it. I was out there last week. Uh, I went to the mom museum and, uh, you know, Gary, you, you hooked me up with the, the guys out there and I talked to them and they were there all about it. And like I said, you know, Frank is their mobster in residence. Yeah. You know, universities have their writers in residence and the mob museum <laughs> has their mobsters in residence. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's out there and he's pushing for it. And I talked to her and she would be really excited about going out there. So I think it's uh, I think it would really be a great opportunity to have this husband and wife yeah. talk about how they lived the life and yeah. and what went on behind closed doors in the in the world of hitting man, lone shark, all around horrible guy, Frank Calabrese Sr. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's, it's a, her description of that guy. So oh, I tell yeah. you what, I, I guess you just live through things. You don't know 
when you mm -hmm. live in that life, you don't know the danger and, and what you're really dealing with. I mean, she knew, but you know, yeah. you're part of it, you know, I, it's just, it's a fascinating book and, and I hope they can get those guys together I out think. there. Plus it, it'll get them a big plug for your book too. So I always want to make that money, you know, <laughs> give me that money, baby. Make right. that money. All right, Cam. Thank you. Take care, Gary.